Thank you very much, Sandro, for this very passionate and insightful talk. So now uh, we have here Gisela Catanzaro for a first uh, common and uh, comment and uh, discussion before our QA. We have time until uh, 6.45, so I think we have time enough to discuss. Thank you very much for everyone. I like very much being here. Uh, Professor Wen Hui and Professor Metzadra have addressed the question of the possibility and limits of uh, critical practice in university today, focusing in the first case in the history of the institution, in the inside, let's say to take Metzadra's words, and on the other hand, uh, putting the accent on the outside. That means activism, social movements, politics outside university. Well, having some points in common with both of them, I would like to to posit as a point of departure for a reflection on the critical tasks of university in the present moment, given this particular political and ideological conjecture we are in, I would like to pose that we have to advance simultaneously two ideas which in principle are not harmonically organized. One, the first idea I would like to propose is that there is, there is no autonomous university to defend. And the second idea I would like to propose is that it is necessary to defend the autonomy to which the university claims to aspire. The first idea, the first of these ideas implies that no meaningful intervention of the university could go without a reflection on the current neoliberal conditions of the university. Rather than being a last bastion of resistance against the dominant tendencies of the outside, the university would have to be thought as one of the sites in which these supposedly external tendencies are in fact actively reproduced, whether through entrepreneurial research or through the dream of an efficient knowledge that remains both independent and neutral. On the other hand, however, the new forms of neoliberalism which are decisive for the global consolidation of new right-wing movements, call for a defense of the autonomy of the university, of its right to exist as an autonomous institution. The possibility of critical social practice in the university is not only threatened today by the generalization of the kinds of metrics of efficiency that neoliberalism has promoted since it, its inception. Today, the possibility of such critical intervention is also threatened by a new anti-intellectualism associated with a certain post-liberal neoliberalism in which the old technocratic arguments are exchanged for even more archaic images of punishment, revenge, and immediate gratification. In this new post-liberal neoliberalism, all critical reflection becomes anathema or an abomination. In this context, something of the situation Max Horkheimer described in his new, now canonical 1937 uh, essay on traditional and critical theory seems to return. Again, critique seems to become suspect 
in as much as it might lead to a recognition of the absurdity so many subjective efforts to adapt to the requirements of systematic reproduction. In the case of my country, to give just two examples, my country, Argentina, in spite of my surname, this new anti-intellectual impulse has been expressed by the figure who is supposed to be the leading intellectual of the current Argentinian government, who claimed that there was a sort of critical insanity that courses through the nation and that it was necessary to eliminate critique from education so that children might be happy, capable, and productive. This is an idea that our current president, for his part, had already sketched out when, in one of his many appeals to the authenticity of domestic life, he claimed that people knew that they wanted to live a healthy life and to plan a future for their children, although a minority of intellectuals persisted in trying to relate that to histories, rationalities, and philosophies. Of course, the ideological power of this anti-intellectualism I'm talking about extends well beyond the realm of university, and it is framed as an appeal to the transparency of the world and of one's own desires, an appeal that considers superfluous all consideration on the subject's opacity, instead privileging its vital, immediate, and self-evident interests. But if this generalized anti-intellectualism commands so many resources in its effort to delegitimize de universities and teaching, this is because at the same time it is suspicious of anything in higher education in Argentina that is not fully translatable into the terms of market in cultural goods. I would argue then that in the university, in my university, during the last decades, not everything has been neoliberal. And that it is precisely this non-liberal, neoliberal excess, or this reminder, that today the anti-intellectual tendencies promoted by right-wing movements seeks to forget, to target, sorry. Clearly, I'm not speaking from within a vacuum, but rather from a situated per perspective, the perspective of Argentina's massive public and free universities. And more specifically, I'm talking from the perspective of Universidad de Buenos Aires. In the context of this university, direct exposure to the exigence of the market the kind of exposure against which our Chilean colleagues protest in their universities, this direct ex exposure is as unimaginable as the enclosed interiority of universitary life in the United States, which Arthur Ricardo Piglia compared to the life in medieval monasteries, places characterized as he humorously said, by rites of, rites of initiation that were unintelligible for the rest of society. Unlike both of these contexts, that is, the Chilean and the US university context, the institution that is the University of Buenos Aires retains what might be called porous borders. These borders are messy and never warranted. But for these very reasons, they are also susceptible to the problematization of the relations that the institution maintains with its broader social context. I would like to suggest 
that it is the porosity of these borders that favors a certain kind of autonomy on the part of university with respect to neoliberalism and indeed the university's own neoliberalization. With this porosity, Argentinian public universities have always sought to oppose the academicism and that has kept them open to what Althusser called action at distance of social struggles. These have included struggles for universal, public, and free higher education, struggles for memory and justice after the crimes against humanity committed by the civil military dictatorships, struggles for communication, free of media monopolies, and so on. Let me provide just an example of the political effects of this kind of acción a distance enabled by porous limits. The quantitative metrics of evaluation that have clearly affected the types of research that are carried out in the academy, now guided by parameters that are supposedly immanent to the academy and that have tended to displace questions of the social rel relevance of work done in universities, these metrics, I mean, have in the university, in my university, always been in tension with the problem of the relevance of the knowledge produced in the university and with the question of who the bearers of the right to study in a public university are and what's the structure that is needed to teach them. This unresolved tension between supposedly immanent demands, demands that in fact are not immanent at all, which lead their logics of research, on the one hand, and on the other hand, broader social demands that enter into conflict with the institution's supposed immanence, this tension turn the university into a site for debate rather than a space smoothly adapted to the demands of neoliberalism. Conflicts within the university also generated a certain logic of gratuity within the university, one that could not be translated into the terms of the market. This is the logic against which the current government leads the charge. What is it about university that bothers such governments so much? What bothers them is what, within the university, is gratuitous, given freely. It is bothersome that in universities, research activities, which are more or less compatible with neoliberal metrics, cannot be neatly separated from teaching, which is not. Nor can the utility of what is produced in the universities be separated from the socially relevant problems in which it intervenes. In Argentina, there have been many socially relevant problems in which it, my university and public universities have intervened. Some of them, the studies which have addressed to the problem of justice and the persistence of damage related to the crimes against humanities committed by the last civil military dictatorship the experimentations in art for new forms of collective memory and processing of trauma. There has also been a very useful, very relevant but not useful work uh, made by media studies on the idea of communication. Go, what could be a free and public communication which cannot be in the hands of monopolies? Finally, the whole university has insisted in the right everybody in Argentina has to higher education. Everybody in Argentina has a right 
to freely go to higher education, but it is not enough to say it. You have to create the ways to guarantee that. And that is a problem that crosses immanently every day our university. It is not a problem from the outside. We don't get in contact with politics when we go outside. We have every day this problem inside university. It is political and it is immanent. All of this social relevant intervention in the university, from the university, had to bring about a crisis in already consolidated social understandings of justice, memory, communication, and education. And they achieved this by altering the supposedly self-evident meanings of these terms, estranging them from their received meanings and demanding that they be changed in the light of what still was unjust in them, restrictive, limited in them. But at the same time, this alteration, this interruption of received understanding did not proceed from inside only the university. It did pro proceed from the inside, but an inside which was already in connection with social forces which were transcendent and at the same time didn't exist a combination of action because that transcendence was immanent to the university. For all these reasons, I believe that the truly relevant task for reflection on the critical potentials of the university today cannot be located within any of the antithesis that I mentioned at the beginning of this response. We should instead look at the borders separating the terms of this antithesis. It is not enough to say there is no university autonomy because our universities only reproduce heteronomy from within letting themselves be reshaped by logics of the market. That is not enough to me, nor it is enough to say we need to defend autonomy of the university against current anti-intellectual tendencies promoted by new right-wing movements. In my view, in order to elaborate the university's critical potentials today, we crucially need to think the problem of autonomy. The problem of enabling its arrival, its emergency in history, but also the problem of thinking autonomy in the first place, of conceiving the existence of the university's autonomy. And what I would like to suggest is that no image of enclosure or of being shielded as in a besieged fortress can help us to address this question, can help us to think autonomy. The worst thing that the university can do is close its doors, supposing that it can engage in a critique from within a pure interiority. On the contrary, I believe that a more robust understanding of critique is possible if the question of the university's autonomy is recognized once again as a problematic one. This is not a matter of retaining confidence in an autonomy that would already supposedly be warranted by the existence of enclosures following their own immanent logic, nor it is a matter of the undifferentiated integration of the university into today's anti-intellectualist social tendencies. I think it is a matter of cultivating the porosity of our university institutions, of reading these institutions from within as fields of battle 
and not as homogeneous blocks, recognizing them instead as social forces above all, as sites in which broader social and struggles are fought. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gisela Catanzaro. And now, dear friends, dear comrades, dear colleagues, dear stakeholders, we can uh, open our uh, discussion if the mic will allow us. There is another one open, yes. So we have a mic that can circulate in, uh, among the audience, so feel free to uh, intervene. As usual, we need the first one. Do you hear me? Uh, so my question would be maybe directed to Sandro Mezzandra um, and this issue of inside and outside of the university. And when you were talking about academic labor and the necessity of engaging, investigating into social conditions and so on, I was wondering whether uh, we are not sometimes already presupposing an equivalence between the university and academic labor because when, when I think about for instance my university in London and um, let's say different catering services, um, uh, security services, um, I don't know administrative and so on tasks, they are all outsourced or most of them are outsourced so they already constitute an outside so I was thinking whether one way to politicize the issue of let's say, what, what is a university might not be to think about those different kinds of labor as taking part of some kind of inside maybe, together without this implying an equality or let's say uh, that, it, that some kind of homogenous idea of what this university means, I'm not sure. Can, I think we can collect a few questions and then have a first round of answering. There is one over there. Thank you very much. Good, good afternoon. Um, I work at UNESCO, uh, based in Rabat in Morocco. I'd like to have your insight on uh, two discourses, let's say, which is, I think, proceeding from one single discourse. Uh, that is, one is the employability, the term employability of our youth. Uh, you know, many organizations, including World Bank, for instance, are talking about how much our youth youngsters are employable in the job market uh, after, after receiving the initial training at universities. And the second discourse is the notion of discrepancy between um, education at the university level and the job market. So I would like to, to have your insight on these two discourses, uh, em employability of our youth and discrepancy between uh, education and job market. Do you think it is a real problem that our global societies have to face or it is proceeding from a certain ideological analysis of the problem, uh, economical problem, but also um, the problem of education in our societies. Thank you. Over there, there is one over there, Premesh. Thank you very much, um, and thanks for a very exciting panel. I want to ask about a, how one would, might square the question of study and revolt, especially under conditions when the general tendency is towards a de-schooling of society. So if you think about you know, everything from MOOCs, I'm saying how might one square the question of study and revolt under conditions when 
there's a tendency towards de-schooling society. So, you know, from Ivan Illich's work onwards, if you think about the ways in which questions of um, MOOCs, you know, all of these ways in which the, the idea of schooling has become completely disaggregated and disassembled, um, I'm, I'm very interested in how you might think about the squaring of the question of study and revolt. But the second question I have is how does one deal with the, you know, let me put it this way, might one find in irony a resource for critique? And I'm thinking here of you know, this wonderful center that William Kentridge set up in, in South Africa called the Center for the Less Good Idea. And I'm wondering why it is we in the humanities consistently kind of present ourselves as the greatest and the best and the ones with the biggest towers as, as we were saying earlier today, instead of thinking about irony as a possible site of critique from within the institution of the university. Maybe we can collect if there is one, another one, another questions, and then we start the first round of comments. Well, um, thank you very much for uh, all the presentations. Um, I wanted to ask both of the um, uh, the first two uh, presenters about the like it. It didn't. It, it wasn't clear to me what you were describing as university. Is it? a public university, private university, autonomous or not autonomous. I mean, it didn't, it wasn't clear to me what the concept of university you, uh, what, what concept of university you were working with. And to Gisela, I think uh, this idea of the uh, frontera porosa, porous borders is, is, a, is a great concept to think about the university because um, I think uh, autonomy as a as a condition of possibility for a universal university, but at the same time we have to think about that concept or um, or condition uh, in a critical way. For example, um, in UNAM, the Autonomous National University of Mexico, the autonomy was won uh, um, through a right wing movement. So, um, and the idea or the, the, um, the political, uh, the, yeah, the, the politic that they were seeking was exactly to step out of, of the social or of the social needs. So uh, I think we have to think of, of autonomy in the, within the university um, also as paradoxical or as it, it reminded me of, of Herderling's poem, but where the danger is also grows the saving power. So I think autonomy should also, I mean, we should, have, we should think of autonomy in a critical way too. Okay, we can have a first round of comments and then uh, eventually have other questions. So, Juan, uh, you wanna start? No, I just want to say this thing about autonomy. The thing is that I think they have won because they have got us to think autonomy as synonymous of independence. And to me, autonomy does, has nothing to do with independence. So, of course, if you understand autonomy as how to be secure that you are not touched, of course, <laughs> I mean, that leads to a notion of university enclosing itself. And we are again in the old ideology of positivism. Yeah. But I wouldn't call that autonomy. I would call that the dream of independence. Sandro? Well, uh of course, uh, uh, I uh, overemphasized uh, uh, my point, and uh, I did it uh, on purpose. It's a kind of well-known uh, rhetorical strategy that I like very much uh, uh, to use, to employ, uh, together with irony. I do my best. And then, uh, the results can be modest. Mm. 
So that was a, a kind of uh, of emphasis in my talk that uh, also uh, led to a kind of oversimplification. What uh, has been said regarding uh, the equivalence uh, between academic labor and uh, the university is very important, and I agree with the point uh, that uh, has been made. The university cannot be reduced uh, to uh, academic labor. Hmm? There have been uh, very important struggles uh, of uh, cleaners uh, in uh, a quite huge uh, southern Italian university over the last two months uh, at the University of Salerno, and such uh, uh, struggles and mobilizations remind us precisely of the fact that uh, the equivalence uh, between academic labor and uh, uh, university is a false uh, uh, equivalence. And of course, I mean, you find the outside in the, in the, in, in the inside. Huh? I have written with Brett Nielsen uh, a very long uh, book uh, on borders where we play with uh, these figures of the inside within the outside, Peter Handke, for uh, uh, maybe uh, some uh, of you. The porosity of uh, uh, borders uh, and uh, so on. This is uh, a very uh, important uh, uh, point. Hmm? that has also to do with the question of uh, autonomy. There are, uh, of course, uh, autonomous uh, spaces within uh, each uh, uh, university system. There are uh, university systems that uh, have kept uh, this kind uh, of uh, autonomous character uh, that uh, has been produced uh, by specific histories, uh, as uh, in the case uh, of uh, Argentina. Hmm? I can, uh, I can tell you, I am always uh, ready to uh, mobilize, uh, to uh, spend uh, uh, words uh, and uh, uh, to sign calls uh, to defend the autonomy of the university in the sense that uh, uh, it has been uh, uh, clarified by Gisela Catanzaro. But I am not satisfied, I'm sorry, with this uh, autonomy, I mean. Over the last year, I have traveled quite extensively. I have been uh, working across university systems. Uh, for one reason or for one other reason, uh, I'm not satisfied. It's not enough for me, this kind of, uh, of uh, autonomy of the university that is worth uh, defending and struggling for. Everywhere I sense this kind of asphyxiation, you know, particularly among students, but also among faculty. And then, of course, you have wonderful kind of experiences, like the summer school I was mentioning before in Berlin, like the summer school we are going to start on Monday here in Bologna, and so on. But these are very limited kind of experiences. And usually the, the, these are experiences that uh, involve uh, graduate and postgraduate post uh, students, while the level of, uh, you know, uh, BA uh, and even MA, uh, you are usually confronted uh, with uh, uh, a kind of mechanization of uh, teaching and learning uh, that uh, uh, is really <laughs> kind of uh, asphyxiating experience. This is uh, my, my own, uh, uh, my own uh, feeling. And it is from this point of view that I want to emphasize that uh, smashing the walls of the university, going outside, meeting uh, uh, other kind of subjective figures and experiences is the real crucial moment if we want to talk about the critical tasks of the university today. 
but I'm sorry, smashing the walls of the university also means taking on the risk of challenging the notion of autonomy of the university. In this country, in the last 50, 60 years, the moments in which the universities have been more lively have been the moments in which the autonomy of the university has been challenged and called into question. And once you challenge and you call into question the autonomy of the university, you may also produce the conditions, the material conditions of a reinvention, a requalification of the very autonomy of the uh, university. And just, uh, just a very quick note about uh, uh, the question of the relation between education uh, and uh, uh, the job market uh, that was raised. Of course, uh, uh, you have uh, to uh, take into consideration the peculiarities uh, of countries and uh, regions. I repeat it, in this country, where we do not have a neoliberal university, a corporate university. It is not true that the Italian university is a corporate neoliberal university. It is much worse. It is an hybrid, a monstrous combination of neoliberal uh, rationality and the relics of the old uh, corporatist university system that was uh, challenged and uh, criticized in a radical way by the movements of uh, 68 uh, and uh, uh, the following years. But if you take this country, you know, the situation is really, is really dramatic. I'm, I, I'm not overemphasizing now. We have uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, young uh, uh, Italian graduate and postgraduate students who emigrated in the last uh, five, six, seven years. I've been living in Berlin for the last two years. There are tens of thousands of uh, uh, Italian uh, youngsters with a PhD who work in the logistics, who works in uh, restaurants, who works in so-called uh, creative industry. And this is something that you can uh, uh, see in many places in, uh, in, in Europe and in the world. So this is, a, this is an important question. The other day I was doing a kind of assembly in Genova about uh, the question of migration and refugees. And there were social workers. There are in Genoa 2,000 uh, social workers who are engaged in the so-called welcoming of refugees. Most of them have a PhD. And they, and they earn 800, 900 uh, uh, euros uh, uh, a month to do a dirty job, huh? you know. So this is, this is the situation in this particular country. In other, in other places, the situation is different, but you have always, uh, I mean, to ground the reflection upon this question. Huh? Thank you. One way. So, um, I briefly uh, make a response to the question of like uh, the employability, right? You mentioned that the, the job markets and so on and so forth. Employments and job markets are a very big issue for all the students. Uh, but what I can see the two trends. When, when we talk about the, uh, the job markets, which had a huge implication for the orientation, the whole education orientation, because now the, the so many different kind of disciplines changed to follow that the logic. We thought that the, these will be no job markets cut off. That, so for example, in East Asia, that was like uh, in Japan, the, the Shinzo Abe, the prime minister of Japan, already ordered a cut off. The, uh, the budget for the humanities in all those national universities. Uh, in America, all the same. The Chinese case is, is different in that sense because it's still continuing. In China, we have a continuing expansion of the university systems. Because of this radical expansion of the university systems, that the humanities and the social sciences continue to expand to some 
However, if you look into these fields and the disciplines, you find that the, 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 call, the, set, the settings of the uh, curriculum were for that the job market oriented. So this is the, the, two th uh, the uh, uh, one thing. Which means that uh, basically the whole education was dominated by the logic of capital. The, everything was by the market logics. Second, it's about the job markets itself. I came from China. I, the, the, when I grew up during the Cultural Revolution, even when I, I was the first year after the Cultural Revolution, first year when the university system resumed, I was the first year university students into, into the university. So at that time, we still had, uh, we, no, ha we have no such idea of the job markets because of the distribution, right? That you found the, the, the uh, positions. At that time, the, later the people criticized that the system because you see that you have no choice, freedom of choice because you want to the countryside, poor area, and so on and so forth. But now, we need to think about this issue because in, China, in Chinese cases, the Chinese society was so uneven. Poor areas, mountain areas, rich areas, coast areas, the urban areas. There was a huge demand for the different kind of the university students. However, now those poor areas, no, nobody want to go there. So, which means that the value issue was here, related. The university, whether or not we, how to define the job. This is not only the market. How to define the job itself for our society. I think this is the, the real the issue. And the secondly, I think it is also the, uh, it's the, 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 the critical task of the university was also linked together with the creative capacity too. It's not necessarily mean that the purely we just talk about the criticize that, but the create, which means that the change, the, the logic to, to some extent, the logic of these, that the function structure of the society dominated by neoliberal logic. This is the, the, the whether or not the university can become the site for these kind of the new thinking. But basically, I think that the, the different arguments for these were, on the one hand, the university was thought as a kind of the way famously by artists that the ideological apparatus of the state. But on the other hand, we know that there are so many critical and the creative ideas were were really emerged within that size. So you cannot simply down, uh, I mean, uh, downplay the importance of that size for the creation. But now, it's, we are in the process of, in my term, is it like a corporization, corporization, uh, corporationalization of the university. So these are, is that the more money flow into the university, you are more follow the logic of cooperation rather than as a university. So that's, I think, the, uh, the, the big challenge for us. Thank you. Uh, we have time for another round of questions and comments, if there are. Uh, hello, thank you. Um, uh, I think sometimes when we uh, ask ourselves about the outside of the university, we think of other sectors, um, outside of education even, um, but there's, it could be a way in which the outside that maybe matters most for the university is within education and its secondary education. Um, so I, I kind of want to ask about the critical task of the university with respect to secondary education, because it might be that um, the legitimacy to which the university aspires is that, uh, and this is partly echoing something that you said, um, that uh, any student uh, can and does attend the university, uh, including at any age, but uh, certainly uh, that puts a lot of um, pressure on uh, possibly the university's responsibility to secondary edu education. So I wondered if you 
have thoughts about that, either in theory or specifically in the different contexts with which you're familiar. Thank you. I'd like to thank the panel for uh, most illuminating uh, thoughts about uh, where we are with universities today. Uh, just a couple of um, uh, questions, comments that I want to raise, and, and I, I'd like to applaud uh, Gisela in particular um, in raising the um, issue of um, populism, fascism vis-a-vis anti-intellectualism, uh, because to you know, it is a problem that's come up ever more in the last five or six years with the rise of fascist leaders in major in democracies of the world. I'm talking of India, I'm talking of the US to some extent. Um, and uh, one of the dilemmas as academics that we have faced when we confront students in classes is really the role of the specialist. Where is the role of the expert? the university trained disciplinary expert in the current conundrum to do with knowledge production in these really fraught times. And it's, a, it's something that I'd like even Sandro, if possible, for you to address because this, this issue of the outside, you know, is, is, is a very, very complicated, fraught issue. Right? Uh, uh, you know, it sounds great. It, I mean, we are all temporary. We don't want to be self-referential and be caught up in our own arguments. But, but I think it's, it's, it's a real threat. And, and in some senses, uh, in our times, uh, what, how, in what ways can universities really preserve? So not just be critical, not, not cri and I know that by critique you mean something much deeper than just being critical, but also the, the question of what do, you, what do you conserve, what do you hold on to, and, and cr the critical function of truth making uh, as well and knowledge. So I just wanted to raise that. Thank you everyone. Um, I just had a question for Professor Mazandra, and um, you had discussed when you talked about Max Weber, and he was, you said that if you want to understand the condition of a university, you should look at its graduate students. And so the first thing that comes to mind for me is Yale University and the graduate students who were on hunger strike, um, and they had turned into a union and they wanted to get paid equally. Um, so I was wondering if you could comment on maybe certain, that sort of situation, and as well as how the university kind of acts into these neoliberal pressures, um, or as an institution of itself. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I have just a very local question for Professor Sandro, because you told us about, let's say, this peculiarity of the Italian uh, universities that are mixed between neoliberal procedures and corporative uh, privileges. And, but actually, I think that uh, we know very well this in another uh, situation. For example, I come from Brazil and I can, uh, I, can, I can affirm that we have the same kind of problem. Then my question is how you think that we can deal with these kinds of corporative uh, structures in our universities. You think that it, this can make our critical discourse more weak uh, upon, let's say, the, the society, for, uh, for the society? You know? Okay. Any other questions? There is two. If there are comments or questions very short. We have time for a couple of more. Thanks to everyone. Uh, this question came to me uh, from Professor Catanzaro's uh, speech, um, but it's uh, for Wang Hui, and it's about the Chinese context. Um, the parallel that um, Professor Catanzaro made uh, um, in relation with the intervention of the new right movements in the university context. Uh, I would like to know how this influence uh, from the CCP is, um, 
is shaped in the Chinese context and so how uh, did the Chinese uh, intellectuals um, gain their autonomy? Okay. Hi, so a super quick, I don't know, observation, I guess. Uh, so I'm one of those Italians. Could, could you sp please speak a little bit louder? Please? Yeah, I'll try, okay. Um, so, I'm one of those who from Italy went abroad to be a, a PhD student, so I know that situation. And what I miss the most about European University is the undergrad, actually, the undergrad situation, the situation of those people who are in BA, the bachelor. So, in that moment, I started university before the crisis hit. So, in that situation I found people from I wouldn't say all the social classes but a wide range wider than I was used to and also we had freedom to um, kind of speak about things that weren't exactly productive and that was because also the type of education that we had the type of teaching that we had was kind of like it left us with some space to do that we weren't forced to produce all the time so to say but these two conditions, I think, are widely dependent on a, a, an economic situation that is not there anymore, and especially when it comes to the welfare state that supported me in the first place to go to university and other people like me. Uh, so I'm wondering what you think about the role of university and the critical role of university when it comes to the students themselves and their, their experience at the university if they can't go there anymore. So the question of who can go there in the first place and what type of spaces and possibilities are offered to them within it. Okay, so uh, who wants to start? Okay. Um, of course, now the China political system was, is very different from other, we know that uh, every, everywhere, but on the other hand, the, the social movements or the, the trends or different kind of the, um, the like uh, you talk populism or all, all these kind of the phenomena, you can find certain kind of the, the chassis in China, not the similar, not necessarily similar. Which I want you to make two responses. One is maybe beyond your question, is that uh, maybe we also need to think about the, uh, the old framework to think about the, uh, the political systems and the society. Basic, uh, that the how changed, because we found my my impression was that uh, uh, the political system, the difference between the political system framework was really like uh, the uh, the liberal or the, the socialism, the capitalism socialism, or the democracy and uh, the authoritarian or these kind of the binaries was still there, but less and the days it's more and more difficult to use that to analyze the concrete situation because now those phenomena surpassed the difference of political forms and emerged in every society. You had much more overlapping overlaps and much more the, the common challenges in that sense. This is the one uh, issue. In Chinese case, were, for example, the, uh, the, all these religious conflicts, ethnic conflicts, social equality, and all these issues that were emerged in China. Obviously, you have the huge debates in, in Chinese society. And now, the, the difference, I mean, the situation here is that, I, uh, the, on the one hand, you have the official censorship. That the censorship was also transformed because basically the censorship is through the digital technology. This, pick up some keywords to, to do that. It's really the, the old form of political campaign almost disappeared. It's really the politicized form of the censorship even. 
But uh, so that's why if we focus on that side, people thought that the more and the more it seemed that the the uh, the, the everything was sort of as uh, more forbidden or the uh, the hidden behind uh, the doors. But on the other hand, if you look at the debate in the everyday space, in Chinese case, the most active space was the WeChat. If our different views confronted each other every day, every minute, almost. So on the other hand, some of observers found that now on the one hand, you have the control there, but on the other hand, the the, the right wing, left wing, conservative, and the different views confronted each other in that kind of the space became a very big, is a big phenomenon. The problem is that it's not about the simple autonomy issue. It's about whether or not these kind of discussion play the critical role in expanding our space. I, was, I served as the editor-in-chief of the Dojo magazine for one decade. At that time, different scholars, it's, it's not the academic, but the, all the contributors f mainly from the, the academia. So the both natural science, humanities, social science, touch upon the real issues, different kind of the issues, created that kind of the space. So at that time, it's easily for the, for, for the people to know what's the agenda there, which shows concerns. However, these kind of the journals and the public space more and more disappeared. You find a lot of the islands, intellectual islands, the people talk each other and talk to that. The right wing not talk to the left wing, left wing not talk to, though there are no such direct engagements. So that was another issue, self-referential in that way, not only outside and inside of the university, but also the, the space itself became so many different islands, but no public the space for the engagements, for different the views. I think that was the big issue. And within the university, sometimes, it's people use that the so-called refutalization of the uh, disciplines because all the students surrounding the one, one leading scholars and another group was there. Few dialogues, engagements there was also the phenomenon. That was not the situation when I was in the 1980s. It was very different the situation. That I think was how to create that kind of the space and atmosphere to activize, uh, revitalize that the public space, I think uh, the public debates, that was, I think it's a big challenge too. Gisela? No, just one word about technocracy. Uh, I think what you have pointed out about anti-intellectualism, one way of anti-intellectualism to me is the functional adaptation, the perfect harmony between functions and a system you cannot ask for its meaning for anything. So uh, Althusser in one um, text from the 60s, middle 60s, uh, was about philosophy, it was called philosophy and uh, humanities, social uh, sciences humanas. And there, the topic he writes was the problem of technocracy. The way to, to fight technocracy was to make a epistemological critique of the independency of method, which was equalizing science to technique. He said, to, in order to ask science to really be a science, you should, you know, cut its identification with a mere technique. A technique is only a technique of adaptation to what already exists. Science should be something else to, to, to pretend that title. Well, in my opinion, this is going to be provocative, but if you smash the walls of university, you cannot make that critique. So you lose 
one way, one political force to fight your enemy, which in this case, of course, in one of the senses, is technocracy. Yeah. So that's why I wouldn't do that. I, <laughs> I'd rather make a critique of technocracy. And so I need these walls to make that. Because the, the, the technique is not going to do that on its own. Someone has to do it. Thank you. And Sandro. Well, let me repeat uh, once again uh, that my use uh, of the notion of uh, outside uh, was uh, a deliberate uh, simplification and a kind of provocation, and I must say that the provocation in a way worked uh, since uh, uh, it uh, spurred uh, a lively uh, discussion. In the book I wrote with uh, Brett Nielsen on borders, uh, borderless method, uh, we elaborate upon uh, Jacques Derrida's uh, critique uh, of uh, Foucault in uh, uh, Madness and Civilization uh, precisely in order to challenge uh, the very possibility of drawing a firm uh, boundary between the inside and the outside. Jacques Derrida quite sophisticated uh, as uh, a philosopher, you know. But nevertheless, I think that uh, simplifications uh, and provocations uh, are uh, useful and uh, maybe productive uh, when it comes uh, to uh, such questions as uh, the critical tasks of uh, the university today. Secondary uh, education, that's a really good uh, kind uh, of uh, instance of uh, what uh, I have in mind when I talk about uh, the outside. It's, of course, uh, a very relative uh, outside with respect to the university. But going to a vocational school uh, and talking uh, to 1,000 uh, students, uh, who are uh, educated uh, to become uh, subaltern workers. Uh, it's a quite interesting uh, experience. Uh, and uh, I mean, most of my colleagues uh, have no interest uh, in such an experience. Uh, I like very much uh, this kind uh, of uh, experiences. Uh, populism, uh, fascism, uh, the giant, do I, do I, I mean, completely right. I mean, that's a, a, a very huge problem. <clears throat> My modest uh, opinion uh, is nevertheless uh, that uh, you don't uh, confront in an effective way <laughs> populist and fascist anti-intellectualism simply by defending the figure of the intellectual. I think that something more is needed kind of offensive move and uh, to demonstrate uh, that uh, what we do or what some of us do at the university uh, when producing uh, critical knowledge uh, is uh, something uh, that matters, uh, that can matter uh, in uh, society writ large. And this uh, can uh, uh, be true also in the case uh, of uh, a critical uh, work in classical philology, hmm? not, also, not only for uh, sociology or uh, uh, political theory. Hmm? The question of the specialist, the expert, uh, it's very important. Hmm? It resonates uh, uh, with uh, Michel Foucault's reflections uh, upon, uh, upon the figure of uh, uh, the special, I think uh, it is in English, the special uh, intellectual, I mean, which means uh, <coughs> kind of intellectual who is able to develop uh, specific situated knowledges uh, and uh, to uh, kind of offer these uh, knowledges uh, to uh, movements, uh, uh, practices uh, that are not necessarily uh, 
academic movements and uh, uh, practices. Just an example that I think is familiar to most of you, uh, the legal clinic as a, a, a practice, you know. The legal clinic uh, is, uh, or can be, precisely an attempt to, to valorize this uh, specific uh, knowledge, this expertise that is produced within the universities, uh, opening up uh, the uh, work of uh, students and faculty toward uh, what I call, with the novel simplification, the outside. <laughs> Truth making, very important. Uh, again, I mean, uh, I think uh, this is a, a real crucial question. We have to, to claim again uh, this notion of truth make, making, even the notion of truth. I mean. Truth making uh, can happen within the university. It can happen outside the university. There are some uh, basic truths that uh, uh, support uh, our thinking and our practices uh, that uh, uh, were produced, were made outside uh, of uh, the university. The idea that, I put it very simply, women must not be subordinated to men, which is for me a quite important truth, uh, was not made uh, at the university. Of course, many uh, people, uh, uh, many women working at the universities played a role, but this truth uh, was produced outside of the university. Then uh, the question of uh, unionizing uh, of uh, graduate students, uh, that's again a very important question. I mean, we should have uh, more time to discuss it uh, uh, in detail, but in the last project uh, I was mentioned in this uh, social movements lab uh, that we are starting at Duke uh, University with uh, Michael Hart, uh, we uh, have uh, uh, this question, the uh, unionization of uh, graduate and postgraduate students as one of the threats uh, that uh, we intend uh, to follow in the next uh, three years. <laughs> Again, the questions regarding uh, the Italian university are uh, quite uh, tricky questions uh, uh, for me. I was saying that in this country, contrary to what uh, many of uh, uh, my friends, uh, to what uh, the last two important students' movements uh, have claimed in this country in 2008 and, and in 2010, we have not a corporate uh, university. The Italian university system is not uh, a neoliberal university system. It is a university system within which powerful trends toward neoliberalization are uh, uh, in a way compelled to come to terms, to negotiate uh, with uh, the survival of the old uh, corporatist system. Just one example, the, organi the organization of uh, academic disciplines in uh, this country, a question that has to do with the inside of the university. When I try to explain uh, the organization of academic disciplines uh, to a US American colleague, to an Argentinian colleague, to an Indian colleague, they do not understand. They do not understand the, the huge difference uh, between uh, political philosophy and history of political ideas or uh, sociology of labor and sociology of industry. Again, I have not the time to expand on this crucial point. But it is important to know that uh, the organization of academic disciplines uh, in this country has nothing to do with uh, a neoliberal managerial uh, uh, rationality. And in this particular case, I think that a bit of neoliberalism could uh, help us uh, to uh, change something uh, in the university. Mm. Uh, 
uh, let me conclude uh, by saying uh, that uh, I am uh, aware of the fact uh, that uh, the critical tasks uh, of uh, the university uh, must be conceived in plural, uh, that we have to develop uh, a very cautious, uh, well-articulated, uh, multi-level uh, program uh, and uh, practice. Uh, I am aware of the fact uh, that uh, in uh, many places, uh, in many conjunctures, uh, the defense of the public character of the university, the defense of the autonomy of the university is very important. I, may, I am aware of that, and this is something I do every day. Okay. Allow me to stress uh, that uh, particularly important is the organization of what Michel Foucault called limit experiences, of the experiences that tear the academic subjects from itself, from themselves, and that smash the walls of the university. Then we can build other walls that maybe can help us to organize other limit experiences. I think this is a very important question. I don't, and I close, I don't want to reduce the critical tasks of the university to the organization of what I call with Michel Foucault, limit experiences. Among the critical tasks of the university, there are a lot of things. Reading Plato in a different way is crucial for me. Nevertheless, I want to emphasize the relevance of these limit experiences because these limit experiences, and Foucault had May 68 in mind, produce the conditions of possibility of innovative knowledge, among other things. Thank you. Okay, so we are closing our panel. As you can imagine, we are not we are closing the panel, but we are not closing the discussion. Actually, we just started, so I hope to find you tomorrow morning for the second panel on measures of value, humanities in the age of calculation. Thank you.